thank you so much for your enthusiastic appreciation of this beautiful and crazy film. I'm really uh, proud to bring back to the stage Juliana and uh, Marco, so you can pick your seats. <laughs> We try to keep the director alive until the end of the festival. <laughs> <laughs> At least the end of the Q&A. I know, we, you have water, <laughs> we have like crazy stuff on the floor. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, I, I love this film and it's a movie that really takes you for a ride because you explore a lot of um, different genres in terms of filmmaking but also so many different ideas. And you always like write together and direct together. So maybe to start, before we can open up to the audience, can you talk about your collaboration uh, in terms of like writing the film before you get to direct the film? Yeah. Well, going first? Uh, Marco and I, we met in film school in Sao Paulo when I was 17 and he was uh, 18. And it's been a long time, like almost 20 years that we know each other. And since the beginning, we got, uh, we became friends and we started to collaborate because we both ha uh, had the same uh, similarities in, 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 in liking horror movies and musicals. And also we were very young and we were discovering new films in school and that uh, created a very strong bond, not only between each other, but also with other collaborators like Caetano Gotado, who is the editor of the film, and that, that is also a director. Uh, so we have a long story of collaboration. We did uh, many short films, and this is our second film together. Um, and uh, we really like to, to share all the stages of creation. And uh, we really, uh, what we do is that we discuss a lot the ideas that we have and how you want, it, want to make it. And then we reach to a story, like a synopsis or a treatment, and then we start to write the script. And uh, we don't write together at the same time, but we write, we do everything together. So sometimes one person starts writing the script and then the other picks up and rewrites and uh, keeps on writing. So it's like a back and forth. Uh, procedure and uh, it's the same with directing the film we share every uh, creative decision like how we are going to position the camera what, I go what we discuss with the actors how it's going to be the set dressing and uh, in the editing as well so it's uh, uh, it's a very sometimes we disagree and uh, it's normal because we and uh, but uh, it's a very good even when we disagree because we have to discuss the ideas until we reach something that we both feel that is right for the film. And that make us uh, go out of a zone of comfort as individuals because if we were alone, maybe we would do our idea. But because we are together, we have to create something else that sometimes is more, uh, more unconventional. So I think that's why the films we do together are so crazy. And we also gi support each other because sometimes you, if you are alone, sometimes you think, oh no, but maybe it's not a good idea or maybe it's too difficult. But we, if, you, if we are together and one says, oh, but uh, I was thinking maybe this scene could be a musical, but I don't know. And the other goes, no, let's do it. Let's do it. We can do it. So it's very good also for to have someone to, to talk in the process because one person takes the best of the other. Do you have anything to add? Or no, she, that's it. Was it. A I mean, answer. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, it's a, it's a good feeling when we collaborate because, like Juliana said, we can uh, stimulate each other, and uh, like if we get it wrong, at least we're gonna fail together. You know, we're gonna be there for each other. So it's also it also makes us brave. I know, usually I, I would imagine if you work with a partner, um, someone will stop you when you go too crazy, but it seems with you it's just like an encouragement to really, <laughs> not to just go crazy, but to really explore like, like an idea until the end. And 
Uh, and I do think it works, even though you're taking a lot of risk because you're bringing the audience in a really crazy ride. Um, so what was your original idea when you, like, I mean, it does explore a lot of things and a lot of films, but when you started writing this film, like, what was the original idea that you wanted to explore? Oh, okay, it's in, in the case of uh, of this film. I mean, the ideas are always like they come together from different ideas come to come from different directions, and they then they gather together in the the spark of of what the film will become. And in the case of this film, uh, uh, I had a dream, and I shared with uh, Juliana. It was uh, it was a situation of two women taking care of a baby that was not human. And it was more like an image, not a full story, but uh, we started with that and uh, Juliana was interested and, and then the story started to form around this image and uh, it didn't take long before we had a structure that was uh, a, a, um, about the pregnancy and then the birth and then what happened after. Like the birth was always sort of in the middle of, of, of the story. In the beginning there was no time uh, uh, it didn't jump seven years in time, it was more uh, in sequence. Uh, and the baby in the second part was only a baby, not, not a seven-year-old kid. But, uh, but the structure of pregnancy and then birth and then the relation with the child was more or less the same since the, the beginning of the idea. And uh, from that, everything else came. The idea that uh, the creature would be a werewolf because that's something that is part of Brazilian folk, even though it's an international creature that everybody knows. It's also part of Brazilian folklore. And uh, um, we like the way it is part of Brazilian folklore and uh, also how it relates to horror movies, like classic horror movies. And so all of these decisions and the idea of what kind, uh, how the work relationship between Clara and Anna would develop from a work relationship to something else, to something more complex and, and layered, all of those ideas uh, were attaching themselves to the story as we wrote and rewrote the long process of writing and rewriting a story until we reach, it reaches its final form. She <laughs> agrees. Um, I really like the way that you explore, you know, as well as like the contemporary Brazilian, like, like family unit that's completely distorted. So, so me, like, you know, like the relationship between the two women, then it goes into a different, like you never really know what to expect and how it's gonna take you in a different frame of mind and you're gonna feel completely different things. Um, I love the way you managed to write it and also to direct it. So once you're done with the writing, can you talk about maybe the collaboration and the you know, filming process? Uh, well, we wanted to do a fairy tale uh, in Sao Paulo. So, you know, we had to have formal and also uh, in the dram dramaturgy in the story, the, the way the story goes. It uh, relates to the classical tales like Cinderella and, and such. But also for us, it was very important the reference of the city of Sao Paulo. That would be a Sao Paulo, that it's kind of a magic Sao Paulo, but it still is the city and it shows the, uh, the different regions of the city and the social difference that you feel geographically in the city. And I think the main challenge was that, how to, to have that uh, aesthetics of a fairy tale, but also not losing the reality, the, not the reality, but the, the real reference. And we work very closely with all the departments, especially the uh, production designer, Fernando Zucoloto, and Rui Postas, who is the cinematographer, so we could create that atmosphere and uh, the use of colors that is very restrict and how we would uh, deal with each part of the film so they could uh, have their own identity, but at the same time that they would have elements that would connect one part to the other. And also we use a technique called uh, match painting that uh, was uh, used 
was very much used in the classical cinema, like uh, in Hitchcock and Mary Poppins, and where they is like they would uh, paint the landscape and and film to make it look like that the landscape was real, but there was always an artificiality because it was not like a digital artifact at the time, it was like hand painted. And for us, uh, that was very interesting. Uh, painting is still use it, use it today, but uh, in CGI way to look realistic, but you wanted to use it in the old way. And we had an artist called Eduardo Chao who helped us to create uh, those paintings that helped to to get that strange feeling that you have in the film, that you are seeing something real, but there is something artificial in that landscape. Uh, so it was a very precise work. It was the most challenging film that we ever did, but it was a lot of fun because everything, every ob object had to be taught, like it, it, because it had to have a specific color, a, a specific way. And also the use of music is very important in the film and how it uh, serves to create that progression. And also in the use of instruments, how we would create a, a connection between the parts, but also its identity. And also with the theatrics, because uh, Isabel, who plays Clara, the main part, she goes through a big gap because in the beginning we present her as a, a mysterious character and uh, the main core of the first part is her relationship with Anna and how she discovers Anna's afflictions and how she deals with it. Uh, and in the second part is about uh, how, what became of her, what she conquered after that, after leaving that life and also her uh, relationship as a mother, as an uh, adoption mother. So it was, it was very different moments for the same uh, character. And it was very important, our work with Isabel, and she contributed a lot with the film to create uh, those two parts of Clara. Yes. <laughs> we seem to agree on nearly everything, at least in public, so I want <laughs> to make sure we continue in that way. Uh, I want to go back to um, when you're talking about the fairy tales as an inspiration, so it does seem a little bit like an opposite of a fairy tale in the, the relationship with a mother and child. Uh, can you talk uh, a little bit more about the inspiration for the film as well as fairy tales and maybe your love for a certain type of horror film that would be interesting to see in the context of the film. Well, the fairy tale or the folklore tale, like, is it's fascinating form because it's very. I mean, it's usually uh, we know it as printed text, but it's usually very uh, uh, re the result of an oral tradition, and um, and that orality usually implies some sort of improvisation and some sort of uh, anarchy because of that as well. So it's very, it's quite fascinating to, to to read and to investigate those stories and to see how they change from version to version, from country to country. For instance, to read the, the German uh, Green Brothers of Sleeping Beauty and then read the French Charles Perrault version of Sleeping Beauty and to see that they are completely uh, different approaches according to the one collecting it and and who was the source of that. And um, so uh, I mean, we were. Uh, fascinated by the form itself, and also by what cinema could did with it uh, in, sp in specific moments in time. Of course, we, not only us, but uh, a lot of people grew up watching Disney adaptations of, uh, of fairy tales, and that is a very powerful cinematic experience when you, at least, at least for, our, for us, in our memory uh, of children and watching, very young, watching movies like Snow White and Sleeping Beauty and Dumbo and and seeing how how those movies using this old stuff, maybe not Dumbo because that was I think original, but uh, but the other films uh, using like this this um, old folkloric material could be could become powerful cinematic experiences. But keeping um, in our case, we are also interested in like in the sort of anarchy of the original 
form of, of, of these tales. For instance, to, to give a concrete example, in the French version of Sleeping Beauty, there is a rupture in the middle of the, of, of the story. The first part of the story is the story that we usually know, we usually know about, uh, about the sleeping girl and, and the waking up of, and the fighting, finding and waking up of that princess. But the second part is about the marriage and how the mother of the prince is actually a child eater. She likes to eat uh, babies and she wants to eat the babies of Sleeping Beauty. And so it becomes a family tragedy like of Sleeping Beauty trying to keep her babies from being eaten by the, um, by the, by the mother of the, of the, of the husband. <clears throat> and those two halves are like, they don't look like they have anything to do with each other, but, but when put together like that by the whole, it becomes a very interesting anarchic experience. And that happens a lot in those, in those, um, in that, in that form that we conventionally call fairy tales, even though there's rarely any fairy in them. This just seem always perfect for kids. Um, I also wanted to develop a little bit more when you talk about the cinematography. So m you worked with uh, uh, Rui Porcas for, I think, the first time. Can you talk about bringing him into the collaboration and sharing your vision of what you wanted to, to share with us? Um, he's one of the most interesting cinematographers, I think, working today. He shot all the films of uh, João Pedro Rodriguez, and most in Portugal, he shot Taboo and... Um, Zama by Lucretia Martel that we are actually opening next week, so you know, come back. Um, but can you talk mostly specifically about working with uh, Rui? Yeah, we, it was our first collaboration. We didn't know him personally. Uh, when we were looking for a cinematographer, actually uh, the film is a French co-production. So in the beginning, when we were still developing the film, we discussed it having a French cinematographer, uh, and we talked to someone, but at the end, this person couldn't do the film because of uh, personal problems and, and schedule. Uh, so we were thinking about someone, and we both uh, remember Rui, and we both really like his work, especially João Pedro Rodriguez films, and uh, particularly To Die Like a Man, uh, Morrer Como Homem, which is a film that also has like a magic thing, a magic atmosphere, and it's very beautiful, and it also uh, transits between different genres, because you have uh, melodrama, and you have musical, and you have like a fantastic part. Uh, and uh, our producer knew Rui, and we met through Skype, and we got along very well immediately. And then he came for the pre-production, and uh, it was a very strong connection. And uh, not only him with us, but also his connection with uh, Fernando, who is the production designer. And that was very crucial for the film. And uh, it's amazing because he he loves films, and he loves every kind of films, and he likes to discuss it. And he's very a very sen sensible person. Uh, regarding the story. So every scene, he's like, he understands very much, very deeply what the scene needs in terms of feeling. Like, oh, in this scene, we have to be with Clara because she's feeling like that, so it's important that we shoot that way. He's very connected to that, of what the story needs, and that's very important. And he is like a, a child because uh, he is willing to do his. He uh, helped us also with our craziness because he's like a boy shooting and he likes the thrilling of shooting. He doesn't like to prepare very much. Sometimes he, we want to like, oh, let's photograph that scene so we can know when we're going to shoot. And he like, ah. and then he say, oh, but when, uh, when we are going to shoot the scene, we will find how, how to do it. So he likes that thrill of being in the place and improvising and, and dealing with the unexpected. And sometimes he can be very precise and do like a very constructed lighting that takes a long time to do it and it's very amazing and beautiful. And sometimes like we were very in trouble, like, oh, we have half an hour to shoot the scene. And he likes it, puts a light like this and this and it's beautiful. 
and he he was amazing and he I agree he was one of the most interesting cinematographers right now and uh, I think what I most admire is that how he loves to tell stories and how he loves to be in a shooting and how he is uh, how he is willing to collaborate uh, he's not attached to the technique he is flexible when he needs to be really fast and really uh, improvised, he can do it, but also when he needs to be very technical and to create something beautiful, he is also very good at it. So he was a good partner for the two of you. In the, mo in the no, mob scenes at the end. Like no, I don't like it. <laughs> no, in the mob scenes at the end, uh, we have to put that on the DVD because the, uh, all the shots, like th when the mob is like walking out of frame, then he appeared, he left be left from behind the camera and walked into the frame, like like <laughs> being yeah. a part. It's not in the film, like this part, because it's like after the shot was guaranteed, then he would just leave the camera and like cross the frame like <laughs> like a crazy mob and member. And he used a the late Batman one. shirt. <laughs> Batman t-shirt, yeah. Okay, so he actually he wants to be an actor as well as a DP. Okay. So, so we know Possibly. for the next collaboration, yeah. you should write him apart when you bring him back. <laughs> uh, I want to know if there's any question from the audience. <coughs> we Do we have microphones? Yes, we do. Uh, there's someone here. Hi, um, could you tell us about the wolf baby puppet? Like, uh, how did you, how, how many times did you have to make one? Was that like the first time out you got the perfect one? Or, and did you know that you were gonna spend so much like camera time on it, the wolf baby? Like, I, I assume that's a practical effect. It looks like one. Yeah, the baby, um, we, wor we worked with two French companies for special effects and one Brazilian company. And uh, one of them, it's called Atelier 69, was responsible for animatronic and, and some makeup effects. And one of the things that they did was, was the baby. Uh, there was a lot of discussion to, uh, between us and the team and these companies to decide exactly what would be makeup, what would be animatronic, what would be CGI. Um, especially uh, as directors, we didn't have all the experience like to decide by ourselves. It was very important to have conversations with them and, but we did reach this conclusion that the baby should be um, animatronic with just like f maybe a few enhancements um, here and there on the mouth, maybe on the eye to, to help it. But in the end, uh, what we basically what we did is, was just erase the cables uh, that made the hair turn because the baby itself that this company um, designed was, was so amazing. Uh, it took two peop three people to, uh, to make him work. Uh, one, one making him breathe, the other like moving the head and, and, and the hands, and one just for the remote control of the eyes and tongue and mouth, which really like opened and, and moved around. And it was a very uh, uh, lively and expressive face that the baby had. So it was, it was a hard day of shooting, sp uh, specifically the day we shot the, this scene, because we had a lot to do, and uh, and uh, we were dealing with this with this very delicate object. But it was also, even though we, like it was a long and we, it was very late, we were very tired. It was it was also a lot of pleasure because we were actually seeing the baby perform with Isabel, and Isabel perform with the baby. So it was uh, it was really a, a, like a magic a magical directing moment for us because uh, it was, yeah, it's one of those things, like a real, really an interaction between this animatronic uh, creature and, and, and this uh, human actress, and that was uh, working emotionally. We could see by everybody in the team in the set that it was working emotionally. And everybody sort of fell in love with the baby and everybody wanted <laughs> to keep it. And it now resides in France with our friends, French producer. Yes. Uh, there's a question right there. Uh, um, first off, thank you for a, a really remarkable movie. It was wonderful. Uh, a simple question. Why did you decide, what were you thinking when you decided to do the conception scene? 
as the, I'm sorry, the impreg the impregnation scene. Um, as um, drawings. Ah, okay. Well, uh, we decided to do it like that because uh, for us it was a moment where we would know Anna's story, how she got pregnant of Joel, and uh, it's uh, she's not from São Paulo in the the film. She's from the countryside in Goiás, and it's a place that we never show in the film. And uh, it's a very intimate scene where the two women are close together, uh, close to the fireplace. And uh, we wanted to be like a storytelling moment and to also that we could relate that moment to the concept of the film that it's a tale. So it's told like many tales are told from one person to another in front of the fire. And it has a very different uh, pace and uh, timing. And uh, for us, it was interesting that uh, we used the drawings because it was like you were reading the illustration of a fairy tale book. And also the style in the illustration, they are inspired by, uh, by the same artists that inspired the art direction in the film, especially the work of Mary Blair, uh, who did uh, some of the designs for Disney films and. Uh, uh, and we use especially how she uses color and how she uses different layers to do an illustration. So for us, it was important that it would be a sequence that was a suspension in time, you know, that we would stop to listen to her story, and that place in the countryside would be a place that you would only lo know uh, represented. We would never see it. Uh, there's someone in the back there. I was just wondering if you could expand upon your inspiration um, to have the musical interludes in the film. And I'm also curious, did you, when you were writing the script, did you write all the lyrics yourself or did you write the script and then work with the composer to come up with the lyrics for those numbers? The only song that was suggested in the script uh, originally was the lullaby. That, that was think was there from the, very first versions. It was not the full lyrics yet because uh, because we didn't need it. We need like one or two. Um, how do you call it? A stanza in, in English. I'm not sure. Um, like like a verse. Just uh, we had one or two of them, but not not the whole song. Um, we developed that later when we 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 actually realized that we would have to have like the whole. Um, song for the um, for the final scene uh, when we decided that that would be the final scene, the singing of the of the whole lullaby. Uh, but the the rest uh, the, the other songs um, appeared like in the process of not only writing the script but but discussing formally the film. Like uh, the first film that we did together, Hard Labor, didn't have, for instance, a score. Uh, didn't have music. Uh, ha had a little bit of music playing in the scenes, but but uh, it was a movie with very little music. And we didn't. We were not sure from the beginning that this movie would have so much music. But we were. The more and more we discussed the fairy tale and the magic atmosphere that we wanted to create, we realized that that uh, music would, would be great in it, would, would really help to create the, um, uh, the type of storytelling that we were trying to, to accomplish. And then um, in this specifically dr dramatic, very dramatic moments, we would come up, like I remember, uh, for instance, when Joel, uh, the, the final song, the, wait, the, um, the song they sing, the waiting song, when Joel is out in the mall, uh, we were discussing the scene, like what would Clara do? Like would Clara run out in the streets and would she call the cops? And then, and then uh, one of us brought up this idea, like that maybe they should just like stay there and sing, sing their wishes, like it's, it's like um, uh, properly 
uh, we were understanding as we discussed the film that it was a little bit of a musical as well. And we do like musicals, so we were open to that. And we ended up coming with three moments. And uh, the first one was, was a work song uh, that played in the beginning uh, when Clara and Anna still have a properly like work relationship. That ended up being cut in the editing process because we felt it was too early for a, for a musical scene. Uh, in that part of the film, but the other two remained: the the crossing song, which is which marks the middle of the film, and the waiting song, which is when they are waiting for Joao to come back. And uh, we, uh, I'm also a composer. I mean, we like music. Juliana also plays, so we like like writing the lyric, lyrics and composing some of the melodies. We did work with with uh, the Garbato brothers, which are composers that we like, and they're very good friends and they did the whole score for the film and worked in some of the songs with us, but we were very present in the, in the composition of, ev of, of all the songs. We have time for one last question. There's someone there, yes. Hi, um, thank you for your film. Um, I had a two-part question. I was curious about um, Clara and her mother and this child. There were so many moments when she could have just left him or let him just like, you know, get taken. So I was wondering if it was just more because he was an extension of her love for Anna, or if it was deeper than that. And then if you can talk about the class dynamics that played out between Anna and Clara. Thank you. Yeah, I think what we try to build the connection between Clara and Joel is that uh, since the pregnancy, Clara is much more connected with the child than Anna. And you see that because she is worried about naming the baby and because she paints the room and she's decorating. Uh, so we try to create a connection with the baby in Anna's uh, belly. But also, of course, there is a connection because it's Anna's child and they had a relationship. So also it's like an extension of her. And uh, what we tried to build was that uh, during the birth, uh, Clara at the beginning is very scared with that creature. Uh, and she like takes a gun and she just saw what the creature did with Anna. But when she approaches, she, she sees that it's, uh, she sees some humanity in its eyes. She sees that it's suffering and she helps the creature and she realizes that it's just a baby. And then she runs away with it and uh, her first impulse is to leave it behind. But then she, the baby cries and she is touched by that and she takes the baby. So in our minds, uh, it's also a choice because she is a character that is able to see the humanity in something that is monstrous. And she, and that's what drives us. And, and as th in the moment that she picks that baby and chooses to raise that baby as her, as her own, and that she understands that it turn, it's part human and sometimes it's part monster, she tries to like domesticate it in a way that he can survive in the society. So it's an act of love when she locks him in the little bedroom so he doesn't hurt anyone. It's, it's an act of love for protecting his child. Uh, so that was the way we, we saw it. And uh, for me, it's a movie, I think in a, in, the, in a whole way, it's a movie that talks about, it's, a, it's about the werewolf tale, but also something very interesting in the wealth tale that is the duality between what's instinct and what is uh, rational and how you all can relate to that in a way because we are always balancing each other to kind of live with that, with our body, our desires, but also with our mind and not let one part kill the other. So in a way, it's also about love, how love can be passion and can be uh, instinct and can be desire, but also can be very calculated and sometimes can be even perverse. And uh, in the second part is very much about motherhood. And, uh, and it's like an adoptive motherhood because she chooses to be his mother. 
and uh, how mother, but uh, in this case, is she's the mother of a, a monster, but uh, she goes through, in a way, uh, with conflicts that every mother goes through, because when you have a child, you want to love it unconditionally, and you want to protect it, but at one point, the child will grow up, and you have to let the child be. And sometimes when you try to educate the child, sometimes you it's hard to know what is the limit between educating and repressing. And that's what Clara learns in the second part, and at the end, that she has to let Joel be. What was the second, the second question? No, it's uh, uh, it was um, something that we uh, we felt was present in the werewolf folklore, and but also in 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 all of the issues that we were approaching uh, what, when building the film was the idea of contrasts and extremes. So um, so this idea of of extremes that are that I that is in the werewolf uh, creature uh, also became present in the in the relationship between, between Clara and Anna, uh, the idea of black and white and rich and poor and center and periphery. And, um, and that kind of relationship uh, 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 is in a way uh, normal in, in Brazilian society. And uh, we were, uh, were trying to uh, play conventionally with, the, with that relationship in the, in the beginning of the film but allow it to um, um, to become more to, for of this class and work relationship to become more fluid and change as the two characters start looking and, and really connecting and understanding with each other. Uh, we we knew that in a way was was part of the fantasy of the film. Like it's not something that it's uh, it's so possible. Uh, for that kind of transformation to happen in, in, in this kind of relationship in Brazil. But, um, but that's what, what we try to do, in especially uh, the film being a fantasy, we felt we could go into this uh, unsafe terrain with these characters. And we, wo we own a lot to, to Isabel and Marjorie because they really made that, um, that chemistry, that the, the, the way they interacted and acted with each other was what made this um, this whole transformation possible in their in their relationship. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up for tonight. Uh, it was so great to have you here, and thank you so much for being here and discussing the film with the audience. Thank you. We, we are outside. If you want to <laughs> ask something more, there's more questions coming up. <laughs> <laughs>